بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Greetings Brothers and sisters in Islam Friends Colleagues Students Today we're going to do a book review or a rebuttal of a book which was authored back in the year 2013 by an author by the name of Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer authored a book, here we have it here, called Not Peace But a Sword, The Great Chasm Between Christianity and Islam. Before we get into the review of this book, we want to talk about the author. Robert Spencer, the author of this book, Bob, he was born in the year 1962 and he is of Greek lineage and Greek heritage. His parents came from what is present day Turkey. His parents came from what is present day Turkey and it is said, it is said that he received a master's degree in early Christian studies and he is self-proclaimed to be a devout Catholic. Robert Spencer claims that his interest in Islam began with him learning about the roots of his family history in Turkey. And he says, my family is from what is now Turkey and actually that is the beginning of my interest in the subject of Islam that my grandparents shortly after World War I were offered the choice of conversion to Islam or exile from the land where they have lived for hundreds of years. That is my family had lived. They were those chose to exile and they came to the United States. They despite their experiences which involved some violence and some of the some killings of the family members they were they spoke in a uniformly positive fashion about life over there and made me become quite fascinated with it such that I took the first opportunity I could when I went to college to read the Quran and began studying Islamic theology and history. So the bloody and confrontational circumstances surrounding the purported personal history of Spencer's family provide a logical explanation for the animus towards Islam and Muslims and much of the polemical work that Spencer has produced since achieving a public profile through his website. He has a website called Jihad Watch. Jihad Watch and it also explains his hostility towards Turkey and the reason he would join a genocidal Facebook group called right for the ethnic cleansing that calls for the ethnic cleansing of Turkish Muslims. His website called Jihad Watch that is administered by Robert Spencer himself was founded in the year 2003. And since then Robert Spencer has published thousands of articles and blog postings and has had numerous speaking engagements mostly at conservative gatherings and has many books on the so-called threat of Islam and the Muslims. Spencer's continuous attacks against Islam can be broken down into two categories. First, polemical and secondly, activist. Robert Spencer's polemical attack is based on his personal study of Islam as he has no formal education nor formal training of Islam or Islamic studies. And throughout Spencer's books, he employs a number of arguments and tactics in his polemics. From amongst his tactics that he will use, he will project the actions of an individual as an inherent trait of the entire group. So he will take some isolated actions of, for example, uh, extremist groups and say that this is the teachings or this is the inherent trait of the entire group. So for example, a suicide bombing or killing of innocent people at the hands of those who ascribe themselves to Islam, he will say that this is 
the mainstream opinion and view and practice of the Muslims. Also from his tactics is that he would take the most extreme opinions and interpretations of Islam and assert them to be correct, normative and to be the mainstream opinion of the, the Muslims and the mainstream interpretation of the true Islam. Also from his tactics conflating culture with religion. Also from his tactics is guilty by association. Guilty by association. Also we will find throughout his books and what we find in many instances in this book here is his reviving of old orientalist ideas and old orientalist claims. Many times we will find Spencer as well forging history. Okay, forging history and altering history and changing historical narratives to suit his arguments and to suit his deficient intellectual principles which he uh, fills his books and compilations with. And lastly, which is one of the biggest proofs of his non-scholastic approach in his writings is that he'll use references that are not reliable and not dependable as academic and reputable evidences. So Spencer's attack against Islam and Muslims initially took form at conservative Christian conferences, churches, synagogues, on college campuses for the David Horowitz sponsored Islamo-Fascism Week. Also on many Christian TV networks such as Pat Robertson's CBN, okay, giving classes on Islam to the FBI and engaging in debates with the likes of Dinesh D'Souza who dubbed him as an Islamophobe. Okay, so that's from one aspect, from the, the polemic aspect of Robert Spencer's doubts and misconceptions that he uh, puts forward towards Islam and the Muslims. Also, he is known to be an anti-Muslim activist. He is known to be a staunch anti-Muslim activist. And this is well known in many of his embarkments, right, on a course of institutionalization and organizing against Islam and Muslims under the rubric of what? Fighting the Jihad. Fighting the Jihad. He is now the co-founder and leader in two new anti-Muslim organizations. One of them is the FDI, the Freedom Defense Initiative and Stop the Islamization of America, SIOA. And the creation of these two groups by Spencer must be read in the larger context of a growing movement of anti-Muslim, anti-Islam organizations across the world. And they are part of what Homeland Security has dubbed the rise in right-wing extremism since the election of Barack Obama, who was the former president uh, before Donald Trump. For Robert Spencer, this all boils down to what? To a crusade against Islam. A crusade against Islam, a religion that he views as the chief rival to Catholicism. And that is incomplete, misleading, and downright false, and a threat to the peace and well-being of the Western world as he falsely claims. Spencer, throughout his books, and specifically in his book here, Not Peace But a Sword, has this specific talent to put things out of complete context, to put things out of context completely, and make believe. And by using the word humiliation, he creates a subliminal sense in the reader that the perpetrator is utterly evil-minded. Spencer and his counterparts focus on the so-called evilness of Islam and do so with deep hatred. According to Spencer, there is nothing good about Islam at all. In the chapter in one of his books, Islam and Christianity, equivalent tradition of his book, Political Incorrect Guide to Islam, Robert Spencer gives ample evidence of the crookedness of Islam and its proponents. He even quotes Bertrand Russell as saying, 
Bolshevism combines the characteristics of the French Revolution with those of the rise of Islam. Among religions, Bolshevism is to be reckoned with Mohammedanism, right? Islam, rather than with Christianity and Buddhism. Christianity and Buddhism are primarily personal religions with mystical doctrines and a love of contemplation. Mohammedanism or Islam and Bolshevism are practical, social, unspiritual concern to win the empire of this world." Unquote. So Robert Spencer, however, does not mention the good things that Bertrand Russell mentioned himself when he talked about Islam and the effects of Islam on the communities and society. So this is an example of his tactics in how he misleads his audience and his readers. And Robert Spencer, he is not a scholar of any sort, especially not anything related to Islam. He simply does not have the academic qualifications to claim that he is a scholar of Islam. As we mentioned, he only has a one-year master's degree of the field of early Christianity. So how does that make him an acclaimed scholar of Islam? Another problem with Robert Spencer's claim to scholarship is that he simply does not even speak the Arabic language, nor does he understand the Arabic language. And I don't think Spencer needs to know Arabic to criticize Islam, but I do think he needs to know it in order to be considered a scholar of Islam, a title that he claims, let alone the acclaimed scholar of Islam. So this book that he compiled, Not Peace But a Sword, and then we have the subtitle here, The Great Chasm Between Christianity and Islam. First of all, I'd like to say that the title of this book, as it has been coined, is taken from a biblical verse from the book of Matthew. If you open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 34, it says, okay, uh, 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 and it, it is a verse attributed to our beloved Jesus. May peace and blessings be upon him where it mentions, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So first of all, I would ask Mr. Spencer, Bob, Robert, should this verse be interpreted and understood literally or metaphorically? And if it is to be interpreted literally, then would it be proper to say that our beloved Jesus was a terrorist, or he was an extremist, or he was warmongering, or a jihadist, as you described the Prophet Muhammad and you described the Muslims? Many Christians, many Catholics, throughout history may have understood it literally. And this could be the reason behind the Christian Crusades, or the Spanish Inquisition, or the Papal Holy Wars, or the Albigensian Papal Crusades, or the War of the Eight Saints, or the Bohemian Palatine War, or the Thirty Year Wars between the churches between the years 1618 and 1648. So in fact, if it was to be understood literally, then what would be your response to these incidents which occurred amongst the Christians and amongst the Catholics? And in fact, according to the Bible, according to the Bible, when Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, took up a sword to defend Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Gethsemane, Jesus rebuked him and told him to put away his sword, as it mentions in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 52, for, where he says, For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. For all of those who draw the sword, then they will die by the sword as well. So why, Robert, 
Why did Jesus say, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. What kind of sword did Jesus bring? One of the scholars of Christianity by the name of Charles Swindle, he mentions in his book, Jesus, the greatest life of all. He says, among the names of Jesus Christ is that of Prince of Peace. And you can go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, the book of Luke chapter 2 verse 14, and the book of John chapter 14 verse 27. Right? All of these verses make it clear that Jesus came to bring peace. But that peace is between man and between God the Creator. Those who reject God and the only way of salvation through Jesus will find themselves perpetually at war with God. But those who come to Him in repentance will find themselves at peace with God. So still, it is inevitable that there will be conflict between good and evil. The Christ and the Antichrist, the light and the darkness, the children of God, the believers and the children of the devil, those who refuse Christ. Conflict must arise between the two groups. And this can and does happen within a family in which some are believers and others are not. We should seek to be at peace with all men, but should never forget that Jesus warned we will be hated for His sake. Because those who reject Him hate Him. They will hate His followers as well as it mentions in the 15th chapter of John, verse number 18. And also in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, it says, Jesus said He had come at this time not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword, a weapon which divides and severs. As a result of his visit to the earth, some children would be set against parents and a man's enemies might be those within his own household. This is because many who choose to follow Christ are hated by their family members. This may be part of the cost of discipleship, for love of family should not be greater than love for the Lord. A true disciple must take up his cross and follow Jesus as it mentions in the book of Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. He must be willing to face not only family hatred but also death, like a criminal carrying his cross to his own execution. So true followers of Christ must be willing to give up even our own families if we are to be worthy of him as it mentions in the 10th chapter of Matthew verses 37 through 39. In so doing we find our lives in return for having given them up to Jesus Christ. So this is according to Mr. Charles, who is a devout Christian. And according to the most common Christian interpretation of this verse, the, the word sword, the word sword is a metaphor. So it should not be understood literally or interpreted literally according to the common Christian interpretation. The word sword in this verse is interpreted metaphorically for meaning an ideological conflict brought by Jesus. So the controversy is that Jesus seems to advocate physical violence by the sword. And this is a view that is rejected by the traditional pacifist branches of Christianity. In the Christian faith, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, as we mentioned previously. And they are taught in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Yet, the sword can be a metaphor for Christian kindled ideological division or conflict. As it mentions in the 12th chapter of Luke, verses 49 through 53 and the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 where it says right it uses the two-edged sword okay and division in a metaphorical and ideological way for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart so, and even in the book of Kells, okay, the book of Kells, which is a 7th century Celtic illuminated manuscript copy of the Gospels in Latin, 
altered, right? It altered the text from gladium, which means a sword, to gadium. Okay? Altered it from gladium, which means sword, to the word gadium, which means joy. Right? So the resulting translation of the verse would be, I came not only to bring peace, but joy. So, if we interpret the title of your book, Robert, taken from the verse in Matthew, to have a metaphorical meaning, understanding that there is an ideological division that Jesus Christ came with to distinguish between the people who are obedient and submissive to the Lord, meaning the Creator, and those who are not submissive and obedient to the Creator, then this is the same ideological message that all of God's prophets and messengers brought to their people, starting from Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jacob, Jesus, and the seal of the prophets and the last of the prophets, the prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon all of them. And their message was one, worship God alone, and don't associate any partners with Him in worship. So, Robert, Bob, Mr. Spencer, this debunks and disproves your subtitle as well, where you say the great chasm between Christianity and Islam. No doubt, there are differences between the two religions nowadays, but there are no differences in the original ideological messages of our beloved Jesus and our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon all of them. And it is important to know that the differences that were introduced and attributed to Jesus emerged many years after Jesus' departure from the earth, after the Council of Nicaea, where as before that many of the Christians were differing in regards to the true status of Jesus. Was He God? Was He the Son of God? Was He part of the Trinity? Was He not part of the Trinity? Was He was the Holy Spirit in Him or separate from Him? And many other concepts such as the Trinity, such as the worship of Jesus, such as this considering of Jesus the Son of God, the concept of the original sin, the crucifixion, and many other beliefs that were added on to Jesus' original teachings many years after His departure from the face of this earth. But in all actuality, Jesus' teachings were the same as Moses, as Jesus was sent to the people of Israel. And Jesus came to fulfill the covenant and the law, and not to abolish the law. The same reason why Muhammad came as well, to fulfill and complete and seal the law and the promise and the covenant that God sent to all of His messengers. So the cause of these differences that emerged in Christianity and were attributed to Jesus mainly revolve around the lack of preservation and alteration of the original divine revelation that was revealed to God's beloved messenger and prophet, Jesus. May peace be upon him. And one of the other false claims that Spencer mentions numerous times in his book is that reason, freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, discernment and free will and conscience are denied in Islam. And that human beings are just slaves of God, without the choice to do as they please. And that Islam teaches its followers to not use their conscience and to not use their intellects. And this is an issue which many of the world's greatest minds have applied themselves and on account on which of which many people have lost and been misguided and gone astray. The Prophet Muhammad's disciples, they didn't speak about questions of free will and determinism. They did not need to because their faith was so strong 
and left no room for these type of doubts to take root which instigate this way of thinking. And at the same time, as Muslims, we believe and we know that the pillars of faith are six. They are to believe in the one and only God, to believe in God's angels, to believe in all of His books in their original form, all of His messengers and prophets, the last day, and finally the divine decree and predestination. Both the good of it and the bad that befalls of it as well. And faith in divine decree has four dimensions. The first of that is knowledge. So we believe that God knows all things. He knows what has taken place and what will take place with His eternal and constant knowledge. He does not come to know these things after having not known them, nor is He subjected to forgetfulness. The second thing, the record and the recording of everything in existence. We believe that God has written in the preserved tablet everything that will ever happen and exist up until the day of resurrection. Thirdly, we believe that God has a will and is, has a free will to do whatever He wants, whenever He wants, however He wants. And we believe that God has willed everything that takes place in the heavens and on earth. Whatever He wills to happen must come to pass. And whatever He does not will to happen will never take place. And lastly, the last dimension of belief in decree is creation. We believe that God is the creator of all things. And He is the guardian and disposer of all affairs. To Him belong the keys of the heavens and the earth, and He is the knower of the unseen as well as the seen. So these four dimensions of faith are everything that Muslims believe about God regarding the questions of divine decree and divine will. And they also clarify to us what agency and ability remains for God's creatures. In other words, everything that human beings say, do, or refrain from, all of it is known to God, recorded in the tablet, willed by God, and created by Him. And this is mentioned all throughout the Quran. If you open up to verse number 81, or excuse me, chapter number 81, verses 28 and 29. Allah he says in the Quran, forever who for whoever wills among you to take a right course, and you who do not will, except that a God wills, the Lord of the worlds. Allah, He mentions also in chapter 37 verse 96 that God created you and everything that you do. So we believe in these aspects of God's decree. We also believe that God has given us free will and we freely choose our actions. This is clearly established in the Quran. If you open up to the second chapter of the Quran, verse number 223. And God Himself, Allah Himself, attests to our will. For instance, He says in verse number 223 of Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter, He says, And go to your tillage as you will. And in the 37th chapter of the Quran, verse 46, Allah he says, If they had willed to go forth, they would have prepared provisions for us. Also, Allah, the Great Creator, commands us, and the fact that God directs commands and prohibitions at us makes sense only if we are free to comply. Otherwise, we would be commanded to do that which is outside of our capacity, since our compliance or non-compliance would be predetermined. Therefore, it makes no sense to make demands of entities that have no ability to comply with those commands. As God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 286, God, Allah burdens no soul except that which it can bear. Also in the Quran and in the teachings of Islam, we find that Allah praises and censures. He praises those who do good for the good that they do and censures evildoers for the bad things that they do. And He also gives recompense to us on account of our deeds in this life as well as in the hereafter. 
And this only makes sense if we carried out those deeds of our own volition, of our own free will, and of our own choice. Otherwise, there would be nothing to reward or nothing to punish. And Allah Himself sent messengers to establish His proof upon the creation. So that Allah mentions in the Quran in, in chapter 4 verse 165 that the messengers are givers of glad tidings and warners. So that humanity and human beings in the creation will have no argument against Allah after the messengers are sent to them. So if people were not free in their choices, their argument against God that they had no guidance would not become invalid after God sent the messengers. Since if they were compelled in their actions, it would make no difference whether or not they received the guidance. And finally, we have practical, a prior type of knowledge that we carry out actions by our own will and choice. We decide to do and what to abstain from without any sense of being compelled in our decisions. This applies to even the smallest of willful actions like sitting and standing, entering our homes and departing, as well as more substantial decisions like marriage and divorce or deciding to relocate to another residence and so on and so forth. So this is why we feel it is most acutely, acutely if someone else tries to force us to do something if we don't want to do it. And this is also why God, the Creator, does not hold us legally accountable for what we do under compulsion or coercion. So also, we believe that every individual is responsible for our own deeds. A sinner cannot argue that he or she was fated to commit a sin, since that sin was carried out by the individual's free choice and own will. Yes, Allah knew in His eternal knowledge that the sinner was going to perpetrate that particular sin at that particular time and willed to allow it to happen, but He did not force the sinner to make that choice. That was a choice which was chosen by the individual himself. Moreover, we, can, we only come to know that it was written for the sinner to commit the sin afterwards. This is why Allah says in the Quran, if you open up to chapter 31 verse 34, He says, No soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. And how can we make excuses for our actions with that which He had no knowledge beforehand? This is why Allah says in the Quran in chapter 6 verse 158, those who are, who are idolaters will say, Had God willed, we, had, we would have not ascribed unto Him partners. Neither would have our fathers, nor would we have prohibited anything. Likewise, did those before deny until they tasted our punishment. Say to the people, Do you have any knowledge that you can produce for us? Lo, you follow nothing but conjecture, nothing but a lie. And do, you do nothing but lie. So in our actions, we are both free and under God's determination at the same time. Since God creates our actions and wills that we act to the extent our actions are under His determination, but since we choose on our own actions and, and we choose on our own which actions we carry out, a choice which God has willed to give us, then we are free in our choices and earn the good or bad based upon our choices and our actions. So to summarize, all of the verses in the Quran which relate to commanding to virtue and preventing vice are all proofs of the free will of human beings because if a person was obliged to do so, then doing so would make no sense. Secondly, all of the verses which speak of blame and reproach against the evildoers and praise for the good doers are proof of free will. Because if one was obliged to do whatever one did, blame or praise would therefore make no sense at all. Also, all of the verses which speak about the questioning on the day of judgment 
and the judgment in that court and then the rewards and punishments and heaven and hell are proof of free will. Because if one was to assume that everything was predestined, then questioning, judging, rewards and punishments would all be oppressive. And lastly, all of the verses which say that a human being is responsible for his own deeds. We find numerous verses in the Quran from them. Kullu nafsim bima kasabat rahina. That Allah mentions in Surah Al Mudathir, the 74th chapter, verse number 38, that every soul will be held in pledge and in responsibility for its deeds. And Allah mentions in the 52nd chapter, verse number 21, Kullu mri'im bima kasabat rahim. And every individual will be in pledge and be held responsible for his deeds. Also, we have verses which show that human being was shown the way. He was shown the right way. He can either choose to follow the path of righteousness or choose to follow the path, follow the path of unrighteousness. As Allah says, Inna hadaynahu sabila imma shakira wa imma kafura. As Allah mentions in the 76th chapter of the Quran, verse number 3, we showed all human beings the way. He can either be grateful or ungrateful and it all depends upon his will and choice. And Allah he says in the 76th chapter, verse 30, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah. And you will not will except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. So all throughout the Quran, we and throughout the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad we have clear cut decisive texts which go against Robert Spencer's claims that Islam teaches the people not to use their conscience and not to use their intellect and that the Muslims don't have free will and don't have free choice. Also Spencer claims in his book, right? he has a chapter heading in his book and we're going over here we are doing a review of Robert Spencer's book, uh, Not Peace But a Sword. And I would call it more of a rebuttal of his, of his compilation here. He also mentions in a chapter heading which he says, which he entitles, The Punishment for Exercising Freedom of Choice, Death. Then. Then he goes on to mention, then anyone who reads and understands the Quran will see that conscience. Okay, uh, so here in his in his claim, okay, in his chapter heading, he says that the punishment for exercising freedom of conscience is death. So anyone, and especially a scholar of Islam, as Robert Spencer self proclaims himself to be. Anyone who reads the Qur'an and understands the Qur'an will see that conscience and intellect is a quality and a power or ability given by the Creator Himself to the creation. If it were not necessary for the human being, then Allah would not have given it to them. And throughout the Qur'an, Allah Himself swears in the name of conscience and intellect, al-aql, as it is in Arabic, al-aql. So the thing by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears about in the Qur'an, this is of utmost importance. In the Qur'an, the word aql, the word intellect or conscience, in its many different forms, in the form of a verb, in the form of a noun, in the form of a masdar, Many different forms we find the word al-aql comes in the Qur'an. And it has been mentioned in the Qur'an in over 49 places in the Qur'an. So the word conscience and intellect in the Qur'an has been mentioned in over 49 places. Of them, 22 places, Allah has scolded man, human beings, for not recognizing the Qur'an and other signs within the creation and other Islamic teachings without using his conscience and intellect. So Allah rebukes those who don't use their intellect to recognize the Creator's signs in the creation as well as in the Qur'an. In other places, the other 27 places in the Qur'an where Allah mentions 
using the conscience and intellect, he instructed human beings to understand the Qur'an and other teachings of the Prophet Muhammad by using one's conscience and using one's intellect. Or Allah spoke about the conscience and intellect in other forms. So as conscience and intellect is mentioned in the Qur'an over 49 times in different forms, this is an indirect proof that in Islam and amongst the Muslims that it has great significance. Allah mentions in many verses in the Quran that human beings will be responsible and asked about their conscious choices and decisions. If you open up Surah at takathur okay, verse number 8. Where Allah he says, And later on, on the day of resurrection, you will be asked about the bounties and the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon them. So Allah in this verse informed here that everybody will be asked on the day of judgment whether he has properly utilized the bounties that Allah gave him in this world. And that means that man will be accountable to Allah on the final day of judgment for Allah's bounties that He has bestowed upon him. And conscience, having a conscience and having an intellect is one of the greatest bounties and gifts that Allah has given human beings. And its place is right after the Qur'an and the Sunnah as regards to the bounties that Allah has bestowed upon the creation. So on the final day of judgment, man will be asked whether he utilized the Qur'an and Sunnah and the conscience and intellect properly. Also, if you open up to Surah Al-Tawbah or Surah Al-Bani Israel, excuse me, Surah Al-Isra, Surah Al-Isra, verse number 36, Allah says, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا that certainly the hearing and the sight and the conscience, the heart and the brain, all of these things will be held responsible and all of these things will be asked on the day of resurrection as for what they did. So here Allah has categorically said that man will be accountable for his visual power, his hearing power and his power of conscience and intellect and understanding in the hereafter. And it means that man will be asked in the hereafter whether he had utilized properly the power of his eyes, the power of his ears, and the power of his intellect and conscience. And one of the aspects of proper use of ears and eyes and conscience is that whether it was, whether did you use your ears to hear what was forbidden to listen to? And did you use your eyes to see that which was forbidden to see? And did you use your intellect and conscience for things which were forbidden? So these three aspects of accountability have been discussed extensively throughout the Qur'an and throughout the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad But another important aspect of the use of eyes, ears and conscience does not come to discussion at all. And that is the unconditional acceptance of the opposite remark of an important person about what a man heard by his own ears, or saw by his own eyes, or understood by his own conscience. Such behavior is tantamount to refusal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's three gifts. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade such behavior in the last line of one of the authentic hadith which he mentions. And Allah has informed man that he will have to be accountable, right? that he will have to be accountable, that is liable to be punished for the use of his ears, eyes, and conscience in both the above mentioned ways. And if you open up to Surah Al-Anfal, verse number 22, Allah, he mentions, إِنَّ الشَّرَّ الدَّوَابِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ سُمُّ الْبُكْمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ And the most worst of creatures, the most worst, of creatures on the face of the earth in the sight of Allah are those who are deaf and those who are dumb. 
who do not utilize their conscience and intellect. So here in this verse we find that Allah has termed those who do not use their intellects and do not use their hearing and sight correctly that these individuals are worse than beasts, worse than animals. And it is not difficult to understand that one who doesn't use his intellect properly or use his conscience properly that his life will become a total failure. And that is why Allah, He said that they are worse than beasts. And this is because if the conscience and intellect is not used properly to understand Allah's divine revelations and divine messages to the humankind, then wrong knowledge will be acquired about many basic aspects of God's commandments and God's religion. And if one acts according to wrong information, then his life will be doomed to failure. And also we have in Surah Yunus talking about the intellect and the conscience. Verse number 100 where Allah says, وَيَجْعَلْ رِجْزَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ And disgrace is imposed and placed upon those who do not utilize their conscience and their intellects. So mishap miseries and dangers prevail upon the people who do not work or lead their life utilizing their intellects and utilizing the senses properly that Allah has bestowed upon them. And this is because there must be mistake in a work if its knowledge is acquired and implemented without proper use of conscience or intellect. And as a result it will not bring about any benefit or any welfare at all. And Allah he mentions in Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Al-Mulk, verse number 10, وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ That Allah he says in the Quran that the inhabitants of the hellfire will say, we could have avoided the hellfire if we would have listened to the messengers and accepted their messengers attentively and take lessons from them by utilizing our conscience and utilizing our intellect. So the, this verse here has mentioned what the inhabitants of hell will utter out of their repentance in the hereafter. They will say, we would not have come to hell if we would have listened to the prophets attentively and taken lessons thereof, utilizing our intellects and utilizing our conscience because if they had utilized their conscience and intellect properly alongside and following the Quran in authentic hadith then they would acquire correct knowledge of Islam that is life and could implement those types of knowledge and those teachings with peace in mind. So it is understood from this verse that the lack of proper use of conscience and intellect alongside or following the Quran in authentic hadith for acquiring knowledge of Islam will be will be a, a primary cause for going to hell. So the lack, okay, the lack of proper use of conscience, intellect to understand the Quran and Sunnah will lead somebody to the hellfire. So from the above information that we mentioned of the Quran and Hadith and general knowledge, it is easily understood that Islam put great emphasis on conscience and on intellect and using the intellect and having free will and having a freedom of choice. Also, Robert Spencer, throughout his book, he tries many times throughout his book here, not peace but a sword, to make the minority opinion or odd and rejected view that has been disproved and refuted by the mainstream Muslims, he makes the minority view to be the majority view. And he makes the mainstream opinions 
the opinions which the early generations of Muslims had and the majority of view of the Muslims he makes the mainstream opinions adopted by Muslims for thousands of years to be the opposition and to be the minority or the odd or rejected opinion especially when mentioning some incidents that were perpetrated by terrorists or those perpetrating to be Muslims and he makes it seem as though this is justified and supported by Islam and the mainstream Muslims and speaking one of the 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 groups one of the the Islamic sects which emerged called the Qadariya called the Qadariya those who ha went to extremes in regards to the belief of Allah's divine decree he mentions on page 71 he mentions on page 71 under the subtitle they have none to defend them from God here it is here he mentions on page 71 about the Qadariya and he's mentioning that the Qadariya have tried to advance the concept of individual free will where in actuality okay he tries to say that the Qadariya they were the ones who, tr who were trying to advance the concept of individual free will but the Islamic scholar the one who studies Islam and studies the different sects which emerged after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and during the time of the companions and their successors okay the one who studies Islam will know and realize and understand Robert Spencer's falsehood and his tactics here in trying to make the minority opinion seem to be the majority and the majority opinion seem to be the minority so he says he says on page 71 he says uh, talking about the Qadriya how they tried to advance the concept of individual free will and they were fought against where in all actuality the Qadriya they had gone to extremes in belief in individual free will and individual choice so generally anybody who studies the Qadariya when the Qadariya is mentioned then what is intended by this group is those who negate the divine decree of Allah and those Qadariya they were the followers of a man by the name of Ma'bad al-Juhani Ma'bad al-Juhani okay but sometimes this word okay sometimes this word al-qadariya right it could be used sometimes for those who are excessive in affirming the divine decree and those who went to such extremes regarding Allah's divine decree that it led them to say that the servant is compelled to do certain actions and that he has no free will or free choice so that he acts without choice rather he has no power over his actions at all that everything is predestined by by the creator by God and he has no choice of his actions and these people are known to be what the Jibriya okay the Jabriya okay the Jabriya and they are also a subsect of the Qadariya okay who also fall under the general name for Al Qadariya and this man by the name of Ma'bad al-Juhani he was the first one to call to the creed of the Qadariya okay and this emerged as a sect in Basra in Iraq at the end of the time of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad so he generally rejected that Allah had prior knowledge and a book wherein the fate of everything is written as well as the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he denied and rejected all of these things he went even so far as to explicitly state that Allah does not know what fate will take place except after its occurrence not to mention record it in a book or will it into existence rather the servants initiate their actions themselves so they do their actions without Allah's knowledge until after the servant has completed the action and that they do not consider the actions of the servant to be from what is decreed by Allah and in light of this 
they differ amongst themselves. The Qadriyyah differ amongst themselves whether Allah is capable of producing the like of the servant's actions or not. And this is the extent to which they exaggerated in their negation of the divine decree. Just as they went to similar extremes in affirming the abilities of the servant, to the extent that they made the servant a creator along with Allah. Since according to their belief, every servant creates his own actions without being affected by the ability of Allah and its influence over his chosen actions. So this is a deviant belief. This is a deviant belief of the Qadriya, which Robert Spencer in his book tries to make it seem as though this was the belief that the Prophet Muhammad, his companions and his successors were upon. So this is a deviant belief which is rejected by the intellect, rejected by Islamic legislation and Islamic texts, and also goes against sound logic. And it is a foreign ideology because this man, okay, this man, Ma'bad al-Juhni, who began spreading this ideology, took it from an unknown person who was said to be called by the name Abu Yunus al-Asawari. So then, once he learned it from this man, he adopted it, Ma'bad al-Juhni adopted it, and he went to Basra, to Iraq, and the neighboring areas, right, because, because of him. And even Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, he punished him by the order of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan al-Umawi, and this occurred in the 18th year after the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's migration. And we find that even the earlier generations of Muslims from amongst the companions, that some of them went against and spoke out and warned against this deviant type of, of teaching, where they rushed to condemn the innovation of this Qadariya and the followers of Mahbad al Jutni, where they, they warned against it and they freed themselves from these types of people. They also criticized it and made it clear to the people the dangers it posed to a person's belief in Allah because the belief in the divine decree is a system based upon Islamic monotheism and whoever disbelieves in Allah's decree has invalidated his monotheism. And also some of the books of history and biographies mention that when the statement of Ma'bad al-Juhni reached Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, the son of the second caliph after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he freed himself from him and from his deviant speech and made his position known to the people. And similarly has been narrated from Abdullah ibn Abbas. And in fact, Abdullah ibn Abbas wished that this person's head right, would be placed between his hands so that he may squeeze it until he dies or at least cut off his nose and by this time he had become blind. All of this was due to his protectiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion and the true Muslim creed that the Prophet Muhammad came with, which for the first time had been exposed to deviant ideologies. So we have, okay, in addition to this, okay, the Qadariya are the opposite of the Jibriya, okay? who claim that the servant is compelled and driven toward his actions of good or evil and is then rewarded with good or bad, which is another deviation. But what is correct is the middle path, the path upon which the Prophet Muhammad and his companions and the majority of the Muslims to this day tread upon, is the middle path between the two extremes. It is what the people of the Sunnah and the community of the believers were upon and still remain upon to this day that there is no creator except Allah. Therefore the servant and his actions are from the creation of Allah and the servant performs actions due to his free will and free choice. Just as he also abandons them by his own will and own choice. And this is the secret of the responsibilities placed upon the servants of Allah and the place where good or bad are rewarded. And the knowledge of this is with Allah and this issue has been expanded upon in many of the books of 
creed. So what Spencer was trying to do is he tried to make the view of the Qadariya and the Jibriya, the deviant ideologies in regards to Allah's belief and decree to be the mainstream view of the Muslims. And then he went on to say, then he went on to say, right, uh, ultimately Muslim authorities declared the concept of human free will to be heretical, where in all actuality it was the opposite of his false claim. It was those who went astray from the mainstream teachings of Islam and the earlier generations of Muslims that believed the concept of human free will to be heretical. Not the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, nor his companions who actually refuted this ideology and debunked it and warned the people from it and criticized it as well. So we'll stop here in our first session in which we are doing a book review of Robert Spencer's book, Not Peace But A Sword, The Great Chasm Between Christianity and Islam. And we'll continue on with our review in our next session. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us benefit from what we heard. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide the author of this book to guide the author of this book to the truth of Islam and the true and merciful teachings